Christopher Columbus discovered America. True or myth? Oh, it's devastating, right? I know. I was taught that in school. This one really gets you. Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. True? Myth. Can you believe that? I was shocked. Hmm. I think it may have been a guy named Tesla. He makes cars now. <laughs> Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We're looking at some of the popular spiritual myths that are so common in our world, so common with our friends and our neighbors, uh, that they, uh, without fail, kind of distort our worldview as well. And we know whether it's a myth or a falsehood or an outright lie, they all have the same root. And Jesus tells us this in John 8. The devil was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. There is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But then Jesus tells us, he says, I tell the truth. Today, we are going to tackle one of the, well, a few myths that have to do with a very important subject, love. Now, before we get into the myths that are so prevalent around us, let's examine the truth. Because I think when you understand the truth, it's easier to identify and it's easier to deconstruct the myths and the lies that are so common. So what did we hear today from 1 John? Uh, In this is love. What is love? What is the definition of love? Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the appeasement, the pacification for our sins. God loved us, so he did something for us. Now, I've talked about this little part before, but I think it's just so common. Um, I'm going to hit it again. The difference between like and love. So often we use the word love like it's an extreme like. Like likes here, but love is like, whoa, like that. It's like, I kind of like that book, but I love this book. I kind of like that song, but man, I love that song. Or I like that movie, but man, I love this one. Um, No. (laughs) Uh, uh, I would say that like, you like something because you get something from it. It does something for you. You like a book, a song, a movie, because it entertains you, or it makes you feel good, or sometimes you like a person because they entertain you, or they make you feel good. Love flows in the opposite direction. God loves us, not because we make him happy or we entertain him or we do anything for him. God loves us so that he sends his son to us. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he took. Yeah, he gave. For God so loved the world that he gave. Love gives. Love gives. Love gives. You know, some people don't like coming to church because they say, oh, church is all they do is talk about giving. Well, yeah. <laughs> Love gives. Love gives. It doesn't take. So it's a, it's a sacrificial thing. We give of ourselves to someone else. It's a, it's a commitment that we make to serve another person. That's what love is. Love flows this way, right, from ourselves to another person. So love, the big myths we're going to tackle today are are so common. They are so common 
that I am going to be able to take every single example from a 60s love song. Right? 60s, what a decade. Great decade for rock and roll, without question, without question. Um, but wow, did love get distorted. Uh, their view of love is dangerous. Here's uh, Betty Everett. Where is love? <laughs> in his kiss? No! It's not in a kiss. It's not in more than a kiss. Physical action. This does not always mean that there's love. Huh. How about this one? Oh, you know that was coming. <laughs> right? You knew that was coming. Sorry. Couldn't get that. I can't help myself. No. Love is not some force. Right? It's not like gravity. It's, it's not some force that just takes control of us where we just fall head over heels for somebody and we just cannot contain ourselves. No. That's not what love is. Maybe infatuation. Maybe like. Right? Which are fine. They're good things. Like is good. I hope you like your spouse. Right? Infatuation is great. Okay? I'm just saying it's not love. Now, it doesn't mean that love is important. Love is huge. So important. Look what, again, Jesus in John 13. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The hallmark, the, 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 the trademark of what it is to be a Christian, what identifies a Christian is someone who loves other people. <laughs> well, more than that, loves every other person. That's what a Christian looks like. And what does that mean? Does it mean you like everybody? No, nope. true, it doesn't. Right? But it does mean you're committed to serve other people, to give of yourself, to make their life better, certainly to make their faith stronger, most importantly. Okay, the three love myths that I really want to address today, again, all from 60s love songs. Uh, now, it was once said that if it weren't for the Beatles, the Supremes would have been the most popular band of the 60s. So Diana Ross said... You can't hurry love, right? You just have to wait. Love don't come easy, all right? All right, so the first myth, love can wait. Love can wait. Love is for later. And I see this so often today. People, and it's every relationship. It's not just, uh, you know, marital relationships. Every relationship. It's this idea that, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on myself first, before I can love somebody else. Well, I kind of get myself right before I can give myself to someone else. I kind of get my whole life in order and everything straight, and then I can sacrifice myself for someone else. So look at 1 Corinthians 13, and we'll just kind of walk through this famous love chapter in the Bible. Paul writes, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, it's impressive, but have not love, only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Just make a noise. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Without love... We are nothing. Love can't wait. And it's true for many relationships. I'll just use marriage as one example. Now, it used to be the average age for couples getting married was 
20, early 20s. Today, the average age of a couple getting married is, I guess, 35. Now, listen, I'm not saying there's a right age to get married. That's, that's fine. What I'm talking about, though, are many times the reasons that they use to delay the marriage. Well, I got to get myself right. I got to make myself right. I got to get everything in order. I got to grow. Got to take care of me. Got to focus on me. I got to pour into me before I can love someone else. Without love, you're nothing. If you're not loving someone else, you are missing out. Missing out on one of God's greatest, greatest gifts. There's a, a, another pastor, not one of my couples, but another pastor told me about a couple that had been dating for three years. They'd been in a relationship for three years, talking about marriage. So they came in for premarital counseling. They kind of went through a few sessions, and then they just kind of realized, they said, you know, I don't, we don't think that we're really compatible right now. And so we think we should kind of wait and just kind of keep working on it. So they waited three more years. Right? They're going to work on this incompatibility. <laughs> there are no two people that are compatible. There are no, two, there are no sinful people are ever going to be perfectly compatible. We, we're all different. We all have different personalities, strengths, weaknesses. And recognizing our own tendencies and our own personalities, recognizing our partner's strengths, weaknesses, personalities, tendencies, how do they act when they're angry, that's how you learn to just work together with the, the different people that we are. Um, anyway, I just, I just see that. I see that a lot. And I think about our relationship with God. Uh, God doesn't wait <laughs> until we are perfect before he comes and commits himself to us. Right? While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Christ came to be with us, to love us, the good shepherd who laid down his life for us. So the truth is that love is for now. Love is absolutely for now. If you talk to people that have been on mission trips, they go overseas, they come back, how they feel? Man, they're just so excited. They saw God's love working through them, blessing other people. Yesterday, you talked to the groups that we, we took downtown to Phoenix to pass out food, right? The love that was shared, just because love gives, right? Just giving that time, asking what their name is, caring about them as a person, giving them something helpful, useful, uh, while they sleep on the streets. It's, it's exciting, it's invigorating. If you're not loving or someone right now, you're really, you're really missing out. So that's the first myth. The second myth is love is an emotion. Right, Smokey Robinson, right? If you feel like loving me, will I second that emotion? Right? Love is an emotion. Love is a feeling. Myth. Now, certainly, feelings come with love. They're a part of it many times. But that's not what love is. Not, not even close. And if we base our uh, commitment to someone on how we feel, oh my goodness. Feelings are fleeting. Feelings, they come and they go. Let's think about uh, parent and child relations. I'm a dad, right? Let's just say, you know what? I don't feel like loving my kids when I see them refusing to do their chores, complaining about doing homework, and ignoring my, you know, telling them to get ready for bed. So I'm just going to walk out the door. That's not love. Right? Love is a commitment. I'm here to take care of you. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to make you a better person. And with kids, you know, I will fight through the rebellion. So love is not simply an emotion. Not even close. Love, the truth is, love is an action. The next section here in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. 
It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Hmm. How about this? It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Is that commitment? Paul doesn't speak of love in emotional terms. Paul talks about action terms. These are action words. Love gives, love does. You know, uh, maybe it was in confirmation. I don't remember. Some pastor once was teaching me, teaching a class on this. And he said, you know, in this chapter here, you can replace the word love with Jesus. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus doesn't envy, doesn't boast. He's not proud. He's not rude. Uh, He's not easily angered. Listen, Jesus keeps no record of wrongs. Now, this is one of the most beautiful passages of Scripture, most commonly read at, at weddings. Beautiful words. But I don't know if there are any more condemning words in the entire Scriptures. You read through that list and look at your own life, Let's not look at all of them. We, we can't tackle all of them. Let's just think about the first action word. Love is patient. When's the last time that you said, how many times do I have to tell you? <clears throat> how often do you say to your kids, hurry up! How many of you in your marriages, and this is something so common in marital counseling, so common. How many times in your marriage have you said to yourself, I just don't feel the same about this person anymore? Like, emotionally, I just think things are different now, emotionally. Yeah. That's what emotions do. They come and they go. Feelings are fleeting. And yet I hear that so common in marital counseling. Listen to this. Everybody listen to this. If you feel like you've lost that loving feeling, you know what I'm saying. Work on these action words in your relationship. You focus on those action words right there. It may save a relationship. So, Love is not emotion. Love is an action. God gives. God loves, so he gives. And the third myth is from the Beatles. All right. All you need is love. Love, love. All right. All you need is love. Now, this sounds like it's true. I know it sounds really true, and it's, you could say it's almost true, but half truth is not true. Um, again, if you look at that list of how we are supposed to love other people, right, from 1 Corinthians 13. We look at that, and it just destroys us, right? It just condemns us. There's no way we can do that. And so what a lot of people would say to us is that, well, you just got to dig down into your heart. You just got to get past all the darkness and the, you know, bad stuff in your heart. Get down in the heart and just find that love that's inside of you and just pull it out. It's not there. Humans can no more generate love than the moon can generate light. We love because he first loved us. God is love. Love shines from God onto us and all we do is reflect it. So, all you need to love, it sounds true, but the actual truth is Jesus is all you need. Jesus shows us what love is. Jesus gives us his love. And that's what we share. And that's how we can give of ourselves and and sacrifice what we want to do or what we think or what we like for somebody else. Of course, it always starts the closest relationships in your families. You know, that's where you really want to practice this kind of giving, sacrificial love. 
action words and let it grow out from there. And then the great promise, love never fails. It's repeated again in the Old Testament. Praise the Lord, He is good. God's love never fails. <clears throat> and so again, let us love one another, for love comes from God. From God. Through us. We don't get to define what love is. right? God created love. He tells us what love is. And to have love, to have a, a patient love, a giving love, a sacrificial love, it must come from Jesus Christ. 